you. Thanks Thank for you. the intro. Okay. All right. Well, it's great to be here uh, back at BYU. Uh, I was actually here last week talking to a small class, which I always enjoy because I get to know the students a little better. In a class this size, it's hard. So um, I hope that uh, up in 710 afterwards, we can have a little bit of time to get to know a, a somewhat smaller group. Um, as Scott mentioned, uh, I went to BYU for undergrad, and uh, it's, it's been a few years. I, I graduated. Um, at the end of 2003 and 2004, I, like you said, in the very beginning of 2004, I was competing in the business plan competition. So um, I love this place. I, you know, it was really the place that got me started with my first business. And so, um, and I just want to tell you guys a little bit about, um, about my story and um, how I got into entrepreneurship in the first place. Um, kind of my, my story is getting started, some of the successes and some of the frustrations and failures. And then also um, telling you a little bit about my current business uh, with Cotopaxi. Um, to get started, um, just so I can have an idea, how many people here know of Cotopaxi already? Okay, how about the Questable? A lot of people. Um, has anyone done the Questable yet? Yeah, it's pretty amazing if you've, if you've done it. Okay, that's, uh, that's helpful. Um, so we launched Codepaxi three years ago. So uh, you know we're still uh, early days, still learning a lot, um, but it's been a, it's been a fun business to build, and, and we've seen some fun growth. Um, but rewinding just a little bit, um, I want to I want to start by telling a story about an experience that I had, and, and I want to share it because I think it's relevant to what you guys are, are doing right now. Um, I have always been fascinated with Cuba. And in 2010, I had an opportunity to go to Cuba for the first time. Um, I was in graduate school, I was at the Wharton School, and I was doing my master's thesis um, on entrepreneurship in the developing world, um, specifically in countries that were communist. So I went and spent time in North Korea, and then I spent time in Cuba. And when I was in Cuba, I really decided that I had to come back. And uh, I wanted to come back and I wanted to do something, um, something different. I wanted to actually experience what it was like to, cl to cross the Florida Strait like so many tens of thousands of Cubans had done over the years. And so uh, for a number of years, I kind of planned uh, this trip and looked forward to, to hopefully some, someday doing that. And uh, about two years ago, I decided it was the year to actually make it happen. So I spent the better part of a year um, training. Uh, I would oftentimes go and spend, um, I'd go wake up at three in the morning and go paddle until it was time to go to work in the morning, or sometimes I'd, I'd go paddle, um, you know, from Saturdays, every Saturday I'd go out and paddle from three in the morning till nightfall, and sometimes I'd start on Friday and then paddle through the middle of the night into the next day until nightfall again, just so I could understand what it would feel like to paddle without sleep and with, with very little food. Um, so uh, I, had, I spent the better part of this year training. Uh, my cousin, who was my paddling partner, did the same. Um, this is my cousin here, and I'm, I'm in the back. And uh, when we got to Cuba, we felt confident. We were, we were scared. We'd actually never paddled 124 miles yet. Even in all of our training, it was impossible really to spend, because it's a 35-hour paddle, so um, without stopping. So we'd never done the full thing. Uh, but we believed we could. And so, uh, you know, we got there and we spent some time in Cuba first, like working with local entrepreneurs. And then when we had a weather window, we decided it was time to go. And we had a support boat that was there just in case. But this is where my cousin and I made our first fatal error. We actually, in our confidence, we decided that we didn't want to have anything to do with the support boat. Um, we felt that we could do this trip on our own, um, and we, the support boat would be there, but we wouldn't touch the support boat no matter what. We wanted to do this unassisted. And when we started off, it was beautiful. It was uh, this beautiful turquoise water. You could see jellyfish and fish swimming all around, and we even saw some turtles and a dolphin on this trip. Just a, it was just an amazing start. And uh, when night fell, everything changed. And we started seeing lightning striking all around in the distance, and huge waves started rolling in. And pretty soon, um, 
the captain of our support boat yelled out to us that he couldn't see us. And there were us and there were three other kayaks, um, some other entrepreneur friends that I'd, I'd roped into doing this trip with us. And uh, he, the support boat started, you know, he, the captain started yelling, I can't see any, I can't see where you guys are. You're like, there's people behind waves and, and above waves. I can't really tell if you're all together. So I need everyone to come as close as possible to the support boat. Because if you get lost, we will never find you. Uh, in the middle of the ocean, in the middle of the night, uh, it was pitch black. You could not, there was no moon. Um, so we all started hovering and getting as close as we could to the support boat. But within a couple hours in the kind of the chaos of the storm, we ended up getting squeezed in between another kayak and the support boat. And a huge wave took us and slammed our kayak against the side of the support boat. And instinctively, what we wanted to do was we wanted to stick our hands out and push away from the boat. And that's what we should have done. But we made a commitment that we would never touch the support boat, no matter what. And uh, so the next wave came and it slammed our kayak against the boat again, right as this boat was coming down from a wave. And it was like someone had dropped this boat from a crane. And it fell right on top of our kayak and it pushed us underneath the water, under the boat. And uh, you know we're, we're strapped into our kayak with our spray skirts. So we're hanging upside down in the water. Um, and our first thought is like, we need to grab the stuff, so it, like our paddles and anything else that's there so that we, it doesn't sink or float away. And then the next thought is like, okay, we need to breathe now. So you know, we're ripping ourselves out of the spray skirts. We're, we're trying to get up and breathe. As soon as we pop our heads out, we hear people yelling, cut the engines, cut the engines. They're worried that the boat is gonna run over us and chop us up as it goes over us. So, we ended up popping out the back. Fortunately, we weren't hurt. Um, our kayak was slightly damaged, but we felt like we could maybe salvage it. So we spent the next two hours trying to save this kayak. And we had trained to self-rescue in a kayak, but we'd never trained in, a, in the middle of a storm. And it was impossible. This kayak that was full of water now weighed about 1,000 pounds, and it was getting thrown around by the ocean like it weighed nothing. Ultimately, the kayak ended up breaking in half and it sank to the bottom of the ocean. And uh, I can tell you, it was one of the most discouraging moments of my life. And uh, that seems silly, because I know it was just an adventure, but this was something we trained for emotionally and physically for so long that it was just incredibly discouraging. And uh, we were fortunate, the, kayak, or the support boat had an extra kayak that we were able to get back into and get back in the water and finish the rest of the journey. But we had compromised our own safety and we compromised the main objective of this, of this journey uh, because we got distracted by something that was completely unimportant. And guys, this is, this is exactly what happens in life. I can't tell you how many friends I have, how many entrepreneurs I know that have been distracted by something that's completely unimportant. Um, that might be money, it might be other things, but the reality is that you have to remember what is the main objective? Why are we here? And if you can keep those things in mind and not get distracted by the, by the things that seem important in the moment, um, you'll have a, a higher chance of having a successful outcome. So I talked a little bit about um, being here at BYU. So, uh, my very first business, um, I was actually, I never really planned on being an entrepreneur. Um, I didn't study business in undergrad. I actually studied international studies. And uh, I'd grown up internationally. My, my dad was an adventurer. And so I grew up uh, in the developing world and um, we always had some sort of adventure planned, whether it was um, making our own, our own raft and floating down the Amazon River, uh, fishing for piranha, or um, we lived for eight years in the Caribbean, so we'd go, um, go to a, like an uninhabited island, we'd go spear fish to survive, eat coconuts, and um, spear fish with the spears that we'd made on our own. So I, I grew up loving adventure and loving the outdoors. And uh, you know, I, I decided when I was at BYU to study, to study uh, international studies. Um, I think one of the most important things about my childhood was that I didn't just develop this love for the outdoors, but I ended up developing a deep sense of empathy for other people. 
One of my, my very first memories as a, as a child was actually seeing children that were my age, that were three or four years old, that were completely naked on the sides of the street. And at that age, that really shapes you. And I started understanding from, a, from that early age that I was lucky. I hadn't done anything to deserve what I had. Uh, I was just born into a family that gave me opportunities that these other people didn't have. And I didn't come from a wealthy family. Uh, there were eight kids in my family. Um, you know, we were very middle class, but I had opportunities that these other people didn't have. So from the time I was a kid, I knew that I had a responsibility to find a way to help others. Uh, when I turned 19, I went on a mission. I served in Bolivia, uh, which is in the heart of South America. And, um, you know, I think the best way to describe this is, uh, for those of you that have, that have, uh, have had children or know of people that have had children, you may have heard of like this love that a, a new parent has for, their, for a child. The first time you hold your child, it changes you inside. It's just this amazing experience. This, you, there's this love that you didn't even know existed that all of a sudden you feel. Well, that's, that's how I felt for the people of Bolivia. Um, I developed this love that I didn't even know could exist for these people. And um, many of you know, having served missions, that you know, when you come home, it's a pretty exciting time. Um, I landed here in the Salt Lake City Airport, and my parents picked me up. And uh, you know, after two years of not seeing your parents and only talking to them a, a handful of times, I was pretty excited. And um, I was just overcome with joy. Um, but as my, as my parents pulled into, into their neighborhood and we were driving up to my, to my home, um, all those feelings of joy really just disappeared. And I just started feeling this immense guilt of just not understanding why I got to live here when all these people that I loved so much had nothing. And it really, for a few weeks, it really had me down. And I, I was thinking a lot about what I could do to, to, to have an impact or what I could do with my life to help. And um, when I was at my parents' home, I ended up reading uh, a newspaper article. Um, it was in the church news, and uh, it talked about a man named Steve Gibson and his wife, Betty. Um, Steve had built a business. Uh, it was very successful, and uh, he ended up selling the business. And they were probably, my guess is, maybe in their young 60s or mid-60s. And um, instead of going off and taking all this money and just kind of retiring and living, you know, living this, this wonderful life, vacationing for the rest of their lives or something, they instead moved to the Philippines and they started teaching entrepreneurship to poor Filipino return missionaries. And they wanted to help these, these people get out of poverty through, small, through creating their own small businesses. And uh, this article was so inspiring to me. I actually, I actually cut the article out and I put it in the front cover of my binder at school. And then I walked around BYU for like three and a half years with this, this article in the front of my, my clear face binder and I would seriously see it like 15 or 20 times a day. And for me, it was such an inspiration. Um, it was there to constantly remind me of why I was in school, what my purpose was. And uh, fast forward a little bit, right as I was finishing school, um, I was on campus for a social impact conference that was on a Saturday. And I was in between some different sessions when I saw Steve Gibson, the man from this article, getting into an elevator. And uh, I immediately recognized him. And so I just ran down the hall and I stuck my arm into the elevator right as it was closing. And I jumped inside and he was trapped. Uh, he had to talk to me. And uh, you know, I went on to tell him how I knew everything about him and uh, probably totally creeped him out. But uh, you know, this guy you know, is a multimillionaire. He's changed thousands of people's lives. I'm a nobody, right? And he's acting so flattered that I recognized him. And uh, he asked me if I'd be interested in meeting him in his office in a couple weeks, so I took him up on the offer. And I ended up um, basically for those two weeks preparing this pitch. I was gonna convince him that he needed to hire me. I wanted to work for him, and I wanted to help him expand his program from the Philippines to Latin America, where I'd grown up. And uh, I went to his office, and I gave him this whole pitch, and the whole time he's kind of smiling and nodding his head, and I'm thinking, yes, I've nailed it. He's totally going to hire me. I can see it in his eyes. And uh, as soon as I'm done, he's just like, Davis, 
I love how passionate you are about this idea of giving back and doing good. He's like, but the reality is, you don't want to work for me. What I see in you is that you would be a great entrepreneur. And uh, of course, looking back now, Steve's telling everyone they would be a great entrepreneur. Uh, there was nothing special about me, but at the moment it felt like, wow, if Steve Gibson's telling me he sees this in me, he's, he must be right. You know, this, this is my idol. This is someone that I've just, I admire so much. And so I left that office determined that I was gonna become an entrepreneur. And he told me that, you know, after 10 or 20 years of being an entrepreneur, then I should be starting to, I, should, I could find a way to find, a, a way to, to have a, uh, an impact on the world, to do something good. Um, but to spend those 10 or 20 years going and building businesses so that I could figure out how to do that on my own. And so my entire purpose of becoming an entrepreneur was I wanted to figure out how I could do good. And so um, my cousin and I, we started brainstorming ideas together. And I came up with the idea of, uh, of starting a business called PoolTables.com. And uh, it's exactly what you think it is. Uh, it's, uh, you know, we started an e-commerce business where we sold pool tables. And um, we basically, I had the idea, I went home and I Googled pool table factory China and found a couple factories, emailed them. Within a couple of weeks, I flew out to China to visit them uh, with my cousin. And we ended up starting this, uh, this business. And uh, it, was, uh, it was amazing. Our, our, very, uh, our very first year, we ended up doing a million dollars in sales. And uh, so it really took off. And we didn't, have, we didn't have a lot of money to start off with. So we, we were having to like borrow money from anyone we could. I took out every dollar I'd, I'd saved. Um, I even took out uh, you know those credit cards you get in the mail that say like 0% interest for like 18 months? I was like the king of those credit cards. Uh, and I'd never had any debt in my life. Uh, I didn't have debt for school or anything or for a car, but uh, I believed in this business. And I ended up convincing my parents and my in-laws to mortgage their homes and give me that money to go start, the, to, to run this business. And so um, to be honest, I was sick to my stomach every day for like six years. Uh, I was terrified because not only if I failed would I lose everything I had uh, because I'd signed over to the bank like my, my house, my cars, like my wife's wedding ring, like everything was like committed. And, uh, but I knew that not only would I lose everything, but I'd lose my parents and my in-laws home. So it was like there was no recovering from a failure, right? So uh, it was something that, that really drove me. And um, so we ended up becoming the largest retailer of pool tables in the United States. And uh, it's a pretty small industry, so it's not really that impressive. Um, but we had a great base hit for, for young entrepreneurs. We had uh, physical retail stores around the country. We sold online. And it was just an amazing entrepreneurial experience. And what I discovered is that I loved entrepreneurship. Uh, one of my, my very favorite quotes is a quote by, by Dieter Uchtdorf. And he says, the desire to create is one of the deepest yearnings of the human soul. And it's true. As children of God, the ultimate creator, this is in our DNA. It's inside of us to create, to build something. And for some people, that might be creating music or art or cooking. Um, you know, but for me, it's, it's building businesses. And uh, it's something that I just feel just an incredible amount of fulfillment and satisfaction in doing. So um, my cousin and I decided that we wanted to uh, sell the business. We didn't want to be the pool table guys for the rest of our lives. And so uh, we decided that we'd sell it, and we went off to business school. Uh, my cousin went to Harvard Business School. I'd always wanted to go to the Wharton School because they had a, a dual degree program where you did an MBA, but you also did an MA in International Studies. Um, it was called the Lauder Institute. And uh, given that I'd grown up internationally, this was really interesting to me. So. Um, I ended up uh, only applying to Wharton. I was lucky that I got in. My cousin was lucky he got into his top choice at Harvard. And then uh, with that first year in business school, we decided that instead of recruiting, instead of going to work for someone, we were gonna spend that year um, reflecting on what we'd learned from our last entrepreneurial experience and figuring out what we could do even better. And we started brainstorming ideas. And if you guys are thinking about entrepreneurship, this is a model I would recommend that you guys follow. 
The biggest mistake I see entrepreneurs make is they just jump in to the very first idea that they have. And they're willing to give all their time and all their money into this idea, but they weren't disciplined enough to run a process. So my advice is to run a process. You need to come up with at least 50 or 60 ideas. Um, there's a bunch of studies that talk about the importance of this, because basically if you come up with 10 ideas, on average, the, highest qual the, the quality of, that, of your best idea of those 10 is going to be relatively low. But if you come up with 50 ideas, the, quality of the, uh, the average quality of your highest idea is going to be higher, much higher. Uh, and that goes all the way until you can come up with about 100 ideas. And then there's, there, it still increases, but at a, at, a at a diminishing rate. And so if you can come up with between 50 and 100 ideas, the chances of one of those ideas being exceptional is very high. And then um, what we did, so we came up with 60 solid business ideas during that first year of school. Then we moved out to, uh, we spent the summer in Silicon Valley, and we took those ideas and we narrowed them down from 60 to four. And then we took um, the bulk of the summer to work on those four ideas, and we vetted them, we tested them, we put a little bit of money behind them, and then ultimately, um, we ended up um, narrowing it down to one idea. And the idea was to move down to Brazil and to launch an e-commerce business called baby.com.br. And uh, this was uh, an e-commerce business selling baby products. Um, I had a friend that uh, I had known from my pool table days that started a business called diapers.com. And uh, diapers.com, uh, when I first connected with him, um, they were doing somewhere around $20 million in, a year in revenue. And so it was like not that different from my own business. So it kind of felt like, hey, like this guy's a peer. This guy's building something similar. About a year later, I, I connected with him again, and he was doing like $75 million in revenue. And it was just like, wait, what? Like, how is that possible? And then the next time I talked to him, he was doing like $150 million, and then $200 million. And I started realizing, number one, I'm an idiot. Because uh, why can't I do that? This guy's building this amazing business. And uh, number two, the total addressable market, the TAM of an industry matters. The, the pool table industry was so small that no matter how fast we grew, we just were never going to have a business that size. And uh, the baby industry was massive. So um, when I was in business school, I thought, you know what? This model would work, and it would work in Brazil. Brazil was this large emerging economy. So let me tell you a really quick story about um, something clever we did with this business that allowed us to get the growth that we had. Um, when, we, when my cousin and I um, were first wanting to launch this business, we knew that we needed capital to launch the business. Um, and you guys remember how we raised money for the last business, right? It was like borrowing money from our friends and family. Like we were never gonna do that again. Like we learned a lesson that we didn't want to have to do that again. So we decided we would go talk to venture capitalists. Now we've never, at this point, we'd never pitched a venture capitalist. So we were like super nervous about this idea. And, uh, but we got a friend that, was connect, that we were connected to from business school that knew an investor that lived in New York that had invested heavily in Brazil. So uh, I came up from Philadelphia to New York. My, my cousin came down from Boston. And we got into this room, uh, we got to this building, we got into the lobby, and we're waiting for this investor to meet with us. And we see him inside the conference room, and there's this glass wall, and like, kind of like a fishbowl. And he's in there, and he's on the phone, screaming at somebody on the phone. And uh, we're already nervous, right? So seeing this, it's just like, oh my gosh, this guy is like terrifying. And uh, you know, after a while, 10 minutes late, he kind of wanders out, and he's like, come on in. We go in, and there was no like getting to know you or anything. He just literally sat down and said, S go ahead and pitch. And so we bring up the first slide. And the first slide has our name, and it says fraudas.com. Does anyone know what fraudas means? Diapers. So diapers.com. And he goes, why did you choose that name? And we're like, oh, well, fraudas means diapers. And he's like, I know what that means. Like, why did you choose a .com domain? Everything in Brazil is .com .br. And we're like, oh, yeah, of course. This is just a placeholder. And we look at each other, and we're like panicking because we just spent $5,000 buying this domain. So we're just like, oh, my gosh. We are like, we're such idiots. And uh, we just, the rest of this, seriously, the rest of this pitch was just a disaster. Like, he just tore us apart. Every single slide, it was just like picking us apart. He literally answered a phone call in the middle of our presentation to like yell at somebody else. And it was just like, we are in trouble, like this is not gonna work. 
we leave, like an hour and a half later, we leave this meeting. And we're going down the elevator just thinking about, you know, how disappointed we were and how this went and how this guy was like such a jerk to us. And, um, you know, we started debating. And, and the big question was like, why did he spend an hour and a half with us? Like, a guy like that would just not just, you know, why didn't he just kick us out after like 10 minutes? And so we're like starting to debate. It's like, did he like us? Did he hate us? Like, we're not really sure. All of a sudden, we look down at our phones and we see he sent us an email and it says, I'm in. I want to give you guys a million dollars to start this business. And it was like, what? How is that possible? And so we're like high fiving each other in the streets of New York. We're like dancing and stuff and we're just so ecstatic. And then we go sit down and eat dinner. And as we're sitting at dinner, my cousin's like, Davis, if you saw him calling your, your phone right now, would you want to answer? And it was like, no. <laughs> I know what he does to people on the telephone. You know? And I was like, well, how about you? And he's like, no way. And that's when we decided that we weren't going to take his money. We didn't want to work with someone like that. So, but what he'd done is he'd validated that we had an idea that was worth something. First things first, we needed a new domain. So we started looking at like 100 different domains that we, could look, that we could buy. Our very favorite domain was this domain called baby.com.br. And turns out that the domain was being used, someone owned it, but it was like one page, it was a bunch of links and stuff, like they weren't really using this domain. So we found out who owned it, and we started to try to convince this guy to sell it to us. And he goes on to tell me, it's a Brazilian guy, and he goes on and tells me um, that he's uh, actually bought 70 domains in 1999. And he goes on to tell me how brilliant this move was. And it was. It was a brilliant move. And uh, guess how many domains at this point he'd sold? I haven't heard the number yet. Zero. Zero. He'd sold none. That is bad news for us, right? Because it's like this guy clearly doesn't care about selling these domains. And he goes on to say like, yeah, I've had, I have interest in this domain all the time. People are constantly emailing me. I'm just not really interested in selling it. So it took a lot of convincing, about a month before I could convince him to even give me a range of how much he would consider for this domain. And in the meantime, we're like trying to talk to other people to own other domains so we can kind of keep a competitive process. But uh, he goes and says, okay, I would be willing to sell the domain for between a half million and a million dollars. So I was just like, oh my God. Goodness, like that's insane. At the same time, um, we had bought the pooltables.com domain and we knew how expensive it was. It was very, very expensive, but it also changed our business. So we thought, you know what, as we kind of did some math, we kind of figured this domain was worth a few hundred thousand dollars. And in the end, we thought, you know what, with the way that Brazil's going and uh, we need a big win as well as we're fundraising, so this would probably be worth paying a lot of money for. So we came back to him and we said, you know what, you've got a deal. We're going to give you an offer of a half million dollars for this domain name. And, uh, but what we need is we need you to finance it for us. And this is what we've done with the pool tables domain. We said, we'll make you monthly payments for like four years. And if we ever miss a payment or make a late payment, you can keep the domain and you can keep all the money that we've given you up to that point. So for us, it's low risk, right? If we did it for six months or a few months and then it didn't work, we wouldn't have to keep paying it. Um, so, uh, and for him, it's, it's kind of nice because he gets this cash, this, this stream of cash, and uh, if it doesn't work out, he gets to keep the cash and gets the domain back. So he comes back to us later that night and he says, deal. I'll do the deal, uh, you know, you can pay me over four years, $500,000, but at the end of that time period, you need to give me a million dollars or 10% of revenues for 10 years. And it was like, what? Like, that doesn't make any sense. That's so much money. And uh, I was so frustrated. Um, at the same time, I was taking this awesome negotiations class at Wharton that basically taught me to not get emotional and to basically put yourself in the other person's shoes to understand their perspective. So I basically told him, help me understand where you're coming from. This is so far out of the range that we'd ever discussed. Um, and frankly, we just can't pay more than a half million dollars. It's an impossibility. And so we'd have to go buy another domain. And uh, he came back and said, I understand. The thing is that you're asking me to finance it for you over all these years. There's a lot of risk in Brazil. There's currency risk and there's inflation risk and there's political risk. And you know, if you got the domain and then you stopped paying me, I would have to sue you to get the domain. And in Brazil, that could take a decade before I ever got my domain back. 
And so all of a sudden it was like, oh, okay, I understand where you're coming from. So I was like, so you're saying if I gave you a half million dollars today, you'd do it? And he said, yeah. I said, okay, um, we'll do it. But this is how we're gonna do that. We're gonna give you $5,000 today, and then the balance payment we're gonna make in 90 days. All we need from you is for you to put our logo up on this domain that says coming soon, baby.com.br, coming soon. And at the end of the 90 days, we'll give you the balance payment, or you can keep the $5,000 that I gave you. And he said, okay, I'll do it. So he put our domain up, and then we had 90 days to go fundraise the tar out of this business. And so we went to Silicon Valley, and we told everyone, we are baby.com.br, and we are going to go take over the baby industry in Brazil. And uh, we ended up raising $4.5 million on a PowerPoint presentation. And, uh, and they, they knew that part of this money was going to go pay for this domain, but they just loved that we'd been so scrappy to get this domain in this way. So this is what entrepreneurship's about. It's about finding ways to do really cool things with very limited resources. So we ended up launching the business and um, moving down to Brazil. And within 18 months, this business had exceeded all of our expectations. Um, we had raised about $40 million in venture capital. We had 300 employees, and we were named Brazil's Startup of the Year in 2012. And uh, in a lot of ways, this was a dream come true for me. I was back in Latin America where I'd grown up. I um, was building this really cool business. My, my two daughters were speaking Portuguese and going to an international school like I had as a kid. Um, so in some ways, I, I was loving everything about it. And, but then there was this big piece of me that knew that I needed to leave. And it came down to a number of factors. But one of the biggest factors was this commitment that I'd made that I was going to find a way to do good. And I needed to do something more meaningful. Uh, I remember um, when I was in Brazil, there was a bunch of Wharton students that came down to Rio de Janeiro. And um, I was speaking to them on the rooftop of this beautiful hotel that kind of overlooked all of Rio, Copacabana Beach and everything. And I was telling them how they shouldn't go work for an, a consulting firm or they shouldn't go work for, on Wall Street for an investment bank. They should go be entrepreneurs. They should go start businesses. They should go change the world. And at the very end, there was some Q&A, and one of the kids raised his hand and said, do you, I, love, I love what you're saying, but do you really feel like you're changing the world by selling baby products in Brazil? And uh, you know, I made this, I kind of responded by saying, yeah, I mean, we're making a big difference here. You know, we're allowing moms to get access to all these things that they couldn't get normally. But the reality is that it was a dagger in the heart. Like hearing him say that it was just like, he is totally right. I am not changing the world. Uh, I'm doing, this is like, this is not what I wanted to do with my life. And so um, I ended up deciding that I wanted to find a way to go do something meaningful. And so I ended up resigning. I talked to my partner and to my investors and told them I was looking to go do something new. And um, I was gonna leave. And uh, to be honest, I was completely terrified. Um, I didn't know what I was going to do. Um, I, was, uh, I was afraid of failure. Um, you know, my cousin and I worked together for 10 years, and I was afraid that if I went and did something on my own and it failed, that people would say, oh, Davis was a successful entrepreneur, but it was just because he was partnering with his cousin. As soon as he did something on his own, it failed. There were all these irrational fears that I had. But uh, at the end of the day, I knew that I needed to go do something meaningful. And so I want to tell you guys a little bit about that. Um, by the way, this is a picture of my dad. This is um, when I, my family lived in Ecuador as a kid. So um, kind of part of um, my childhood experiences. So um, to start off, like, I knew that I could, I could make an impact in the world if I did something that scaled. And I knew that if I just did something on my own, if I went and started a nonprofit, that would be a lot harder for me to do good. But I believed that if I could start a business that could go inspire people to go out and do good with me, that's where I could make a real impact. And I wanted to build doing good into every aspect of this brand. Um, and so uh, when we, I moved back to the US, and the day that we launched our business, the day that we turned on our website, we had our very first Questival. And um, at this point, no one even knew who Cotopax even was. And uh, the way that we got people to know about the first Questival was we actually went on, KSL, on the KSL classifieds and we bought two llamas. 
And uh, we named one of the llamas Kodo, and we named the other one Poxy. And then we went around college campuses with these llamas. And uh, we didn't ask for permission, of course, because uh, that wouldn't have worked. So I remember showing up on BYU's campus here with two llamas. And uh, I'm thinking, first of all, man, I can't believe I just left this last gig to go walk around with llamas. But uh, you know, I was walking around with these llamas. And uh, we're up at the quad up here, right in front of the, um, what's this big, the, not the, yeah, between the library and the, and the Wilkinson Center. Yeah, Brigham Square, yes, thank you. So right in Brigham Square, and uh, it's crazy. Like, hundreds of students are like gathered around these llamas. They're taking selfies, and they're like, why the heck are llamas on campus? And then we give them a flyer and say, because the Questival's coming to town, you know? So uh, they're like, this is the coolest thing. Everyone's posting about it on social media. And uh, pretty soon the universe comes out and does like a story right then about, about the Questival and these llamas. And uh, we're just like waiting for campus security to come like arrest us or something. <laughs> and uh, pretty soon, like four hours in, I'm just thinking, this is crazy. Like no one's kicked us off yet. Uh, all of a sudden, campus security rolls up in this golf cart. And I'm just like, here we go. Like arrest me. I'm guilty. Like totally broke the law. Like camp, you know, llama shouldn't be on campus. They come up and they immediately start taking selfies with these llamas. <laughs> and then they like walked off. It was like, this is unbelievable. You can like break any law as long as you have a llama with you, you know? <laughs> so uh, it was like, this is unreal. And uh, you know, I knew we had something special when I showed up to the first, so the first quest was a little bit different than the ones we do now. But we used, we had, the first one, we had three check-in points. We had one up in Logan, one in Salt Lake, and one here in Provo. And uh, I show up to this, to this check-in point here in Provo, and I'm running late, so I park my car. There's like no parking anywhere. And I'm like running down the street to like this check-in point, and I see this line of people that's like two blocks long. And I was like, that like, couldn't possibly be for us. And then all of a sudden, I started seeing people with Cotopaxi shirts and hats on. The only thing is, we hadn't sold anything yet. We didn't sell shirts or hats. Like we just turned on our website like that day. We hadn't shipped a single product. And people were making their own homemade Cotopaxi sh shirts and hats. And I have a picture still of like, me standing next to this kid that I didn't even know that's like, wearing like, our logo on his body. And uh, then we, there, was like a, there was like a Jeep that had like, our, our logo, our llama from our logo, spray painted on its doors and on its hood and on the back of the Jeep. And uh, I just like, I wouldn't even do that to my own car. Like, I, I'm having a hard time understanding what's happening here. But, like this, this, this questable resonated with people. And it was this idea of creating an experience that allowed people to, to touch our brand. It wasn't about selling them things. It was about allowing them to experience us. And so um, let me show you this quick video um, that shows a little bit about the questable. So we ended up having this amazing 24-hour experience where thousands and thousands of people were living our brand. Every one of them got one of our backpacks. They use, we have an app that kind of guides people through this amazing experience where they get to choose their own adventures. There's hundreds of challenges they can choose from. If you're outdoors, you can get points for you know, going and camping, making your own shelter and sleeping in it, rock climbing, mountain biking. Um, for someone that's like, I don't really like the outdoors that much, there's all these urban fun challenges to do. And um, we ended up having 30,000 social media posts the day of our launch, every one of them with someone wearing one of our backpacks. And so uh, it was just this amazing experience that allowed people to understand our core values as a brand, of, uh, the values of adventure, of creating experiences with people that you cared about, of giving back and serving in the community. And so every one of these events um, generates thousands of hours of community service. We have thousands of dollars donated to nonprofits that, that make an impact in the world. And we have all these experiences that people go, go experience um, with our brand. 
Um, so last year we did 13 Questivals around the country. This year we have 60 Questivals all around the U.S. So um, somewhere around 100,000 people or more this year will experience a Questival. And they'll understand the Cotopaxi brand through one of these events. And so um, the Questival has just been an amazing way for us to, uh, to, go, build this, to go build this brand. Um, let me show you... Uh, another video here that just shows a little bit about um, how we think about making product. Sorry, what time is it? Five minutes. Five minutes. So um, the way we think about making product is thinking about telling stories through product. So we have these bags that every single one of them is unique. We've given a voice to the sewers of the factory. Um, on average, they've been there 11 and a half years. They're incredible craftsmen and artisans, but they've never had a voice in creating the product. They're simply told what to sew. And we just felt like that was wrong. Like there was something more we needed to do there. So we started using the remnant materials, leftover materials of the factory that um, there's a ton of waste that's created in the manufacturing process. And then we went to the sewers and we empowered them to create the bags. Uh, again, every single bag, the only rule is that every bag has to be unique. Every one of them is one of a kind. And so these products, um, you know, tell unique stories. Um, an, another story that I'm going to skip is about, um, we use llama wool. So we went back to Bolivia where I started my mission. And this year we're ordering hundreds of thousands of pounds of llama wool to make products. So we have this really rad sweater uh, It's made of llama wool. We're launching socks in about a week, these llama socks that are just like totally awesome. Um, and we're finding ways that our business can go out and do good. Um, last experience I want to share with you. So one of the things that's been most impactful for me is working with refugees. We actually have a program where if you, um, if you order something from our website, you'll get a handwritten thank you card that's written by a refugee that's been resettled here in Salt Lake City. It's their first job. And um, I've also had the opportunity, I'm on a council with the United Nations Foundation called the Global Entrepreneurs Council. There's, it's an eight member council and we work with refugees around the world. And um, last year I was able to go to um, the Middle East and work in Jordan um, on the border of Syria with refugees that are there. And uh, it was really a life-changing experience for me. But my favorite moment was at the end of our day there, um, all these little kids would always like follow me around because I obviously, you know, I'm, I'm tall, I'm super duper white, uh, you know, bald headed, like er all these kids just kind of want to know like, who, what is that thing? And uh, what is he doing here? So, uh, you know, but instinctively, one of these little kids um, grabbed my hands and um, just started walking up my body, and he took off his sandals when he did this, and just did a little flip. And uh, I do this with my daughters, and uh, pretty soon all the little boys started lining up. The, the girls um, culturally aren't allowed to touch the men, but uh, all the little boys lined up, and they all started doing this, and every one of them was taking off their shoes, and I pretty soon had all these dusty footprints going, going all the way up my body, and it was just this, this beautiful moment, uh, because for a few minutes, these children forgot that they were in a refugee camp. 
the average refugee lives in a camp for 17 years. And these children have been sentenced their entire lives, their entire childhoods, to live in one of these camps. Uh, that night, I went home, and with a, I just had this heavy heart thinking about these children that weren't too different from my own children. And um, as I was in this hotel in Amman, in the capital, I turned on my TV, and I saw an image that many of you probably also saw. And... Um, So as I saw this image, it just completely broke me inside. This little boy, Amran, was pulled out of the rubble in Aleppo. His brother was killed in the bombing. And I just can't understand why humans could do this to another human. And it really, for me, hit home the urgency of the work that we have to do. Everyone in this room has a responsibility to find a way to help others. We're lucky. We're some of the lucky ones, and we need to go look for ways that we can help others here in our community, around the globe. So as you go start your careers, look for ways that you can give back. It doesn't necessarily have to be by building a business that's doing good, but look for ways that you can individually try to make a difference in someone's lives. And in your heart, find ways that you can plan and make plans for doing something bigger as you get older. It might be 10 or 20 years down the road, but make sure that uh, in life as you start having these storms come in and these distractions, that you have the courage to reach out And when your boat slams against the support boat, that you reach out and stick your hands against it and violently push away. Uh, Thank you all for your time, and uh, I'm looking forward to meeting some of you um, up at 710. Thank you.